David Moore with Equity Advantage, and I've got Robert Smith with Peregrine Private Capital here joining us today. And just uh, for the context purposes, we'll we'll tell everybody it's it's actually September fourteenth. Uh, they've got a recall election going on in California. We'll see how that goes. But uh, it's crazy times in the world, and uh, we're talking about DSTs, the economy, real estate right now. We'll talk about inflation, some different strategies, and uh, we want to have a good time today. So we've done this a few different times. I think last time we did it, we were pretty comfortable looking, maybe, or one of the times in our Cali look. But uh, today, today he looks very respectable. He always does, and you know, you got me. But. Uh, Bob, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of business with you for many, many years, and, and uh, why don't you tell everybody real quickly a little bit about what you do and how you got into it, and, uh, and we'll sort of kick it off. Uh, we're our, uh, Peregrine Private Capital. We're one of the largest retailers of DSD properties for 1031 replacement purposes in the nation. We actually, we are the oldest retailer in the nation. We helped create the product 20 some odd years ago with the Inland Group. And so it has been our specialty now for, well, yeah, these 20 years. And I think we have placed, uh, actually, we it's certainly with the Inland Group, we've placed more equity, investor equity with them than any other retail broker in the United States. So we've been around for a while. We've been around the block and we certainly have the, expertise and the contacts to uh, do the job. So how do you how do you get into this? I mean, uh, originally before DST it was tech, but how, how did you get involved with sort of the securitized real estate? It, it uh, most of our clients were income based and uh, historically one of the top income products in anyone's portfolio have been REITs because by law REITs have to provide I believe 90% of net operating income to investors so they've been a high yielding income prop, uh, product and we did a lot of business with Inland in, uh, their, uh, with their non-market traded REITs uh, prior to 2000 and had very very good experience with that and uh, because of the positive experience our investors had with those programs and they were dirt people they owned uh, income producing properties they would always ask us can we 1031 exchange into an inland REIT and the answer was always no because you can't change exchange into a REIT because it has to be direct ownership of dirt for direct ownership of dirt and when you buy shares of a REIT, it's that intermediation on the part of the company that disallows it. So we leaned on Inland back then, the principles very heavily to create a REIT-like product for the 1031 space. And that was in part the catalyst for the DST product. It was called the Delaware Business Trust or DBT back then. It is now the Delaware Statutory Trust, same thing, slight name change. So uh, we were quite literally present at the creation of the product and contributed significantly to it. Yeah, interesting. So I, I was watching Billions actually last night and and uh, one of the, the primary uh, troublemakers in the show was talking about Delaware and, and just, uh, you know, the whole legal organization, you know, the LLCs, everything out of Delaware. But it's interesting how that little state's gotten such a foothold in, in that whole space. But uh, anyway. Well, they're kind of, you know, from a statutory standpoint, they are kind to uh, investors and uh, capital aggregation. So they benefit from that, unlike other states in the union, which will go unmentioned. Uh, so. so so I got a question. You, you referenced we a couple times then. And, and I was on the phone with somebody, I believe yesterday, and we were talking about DSTs and, and, and the gal's comment was, well, you know, should I work with different companies to diversify? And, and you know, we're, we're going to talk about diversification further a little bit later. But, but, you know, her question was, do I need to work with different company to diversify? And I said, well, you got to understand how these things are sold and that we've got brokers and then you've, you've got the sponsors and then you've got the sales marketing side. Do you want to care to elaborate a little bit on that and how, you know, your position in this space is you, you don't work for Inland. You like Inland, but, you know, that as one example of, an, uh, of a sponsor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what your job is and what you do and... and uh, you know, with respect to diversification, I mean, you can take care of it. They don't need to go to five bobs to to diversify. No, it's um, 
you know, the 32 active property sponsors in the 1031 space. And so most broker dealers, uh, property selection mix is going to be uh, pretty much the same. Uh, you as an investor or potential investor in DST have to find someone that you're comfortable with working with in terms of their approach. Uh, you know, is it an educational approach? Is it information based or is it, is it hard sell? So um, I believe we've placed more equity with Inland as a single DST sponsor than any other broker in the United States. That being said, we have selling agreements with all the major property sponsors. And to a certain extent, property allocation, a very real extent, is opportunistic because the DST inventory is constantly changing, meaning as old programs are fully subscribed by investors and leave the space, they're being replaced by new programs. And so it really, a lot of it depends on being in the right place at the right time from a property type standpoint in terms of those properties that may or may not be available to you in your 45-day identification window. We obviously have we like, we have our own property preferences from a type standpoint. We've been very, very strongly biased uh, in terms of operating assets uh, for four or five years now, simply because operating assets, those assets, whether it's multifamily, self-storage, senior living, manufactured housing that have multiple tenants and short lease intervals, give you as much flexibility as possible to raise rents. And we've been telling people now for some time that inflation is coming. And when it does arrive, which it has arrived, your best, one of your best defenses against inflation may be the ability to create or increase rents with <clears throat> as much frequency as possible, much like an inflation protected bond. Okay, and we believe operating assets give you that, provide that flexibility as opposed to single net, triple net lease assets. So we have our bias in terms of what asset types we like, but it doesn't have to come from a single uh, property sponsor. Some property sponsors, uh, you know, specialize in multifamily, some specialize in other property types. So it's really trying to create the best possible mix for the investors. So, so we're... We're obviously in in a, a pretty overheated real estate market right now, and uh, like you just referenced, there's 32 sponsors today. I think it's important to look at history, right? And the old statement on history: those who don't study it are condemned to relive it. And if you look at the DST ramp up pre crash last time, you went from just you mentioned inland, but you went to you know from a a, a few sponsors that were sort of the catalyst to the product. And that sort of exploded into a huge market that then collapsed, and you had roughly a handful that survived that last crash. And now where we've gone from that handful back up to 32 again today, how do you decide, you know, once again, the questions is like, if people are scared, and, and you just mentioned uh, ability to move rents to give the return, and, and a lot of people, I mean, we're talking to you from Portland, Oregon today, and Portland, we've got some pretty extreme rent control, and it sort of is driving the mom and pops out of that uh, that whole space and, and replacing them with institutional money because the, the mom and pops can't afford to deal with the rules where the institutional money really doesn't care. But you know, how do you decide what you're going to sell to your clients? I mean, you've been in this world long enough to have gone through the ups and downs. I mean, how do you decide what uh, is a good, safe place is safety the primary concern at a point like we are today? I know historically we've had people, you've had people that just want to buy something based upon the return without thought of that, and it's come back to bite them. So any comments? Yeah, I think, I mean, historically at market tops, you know, whether it's stocks, uh, bonds, real property, uh, when prices are highest and yields are lowest, unfortunately, people do have a tendency to do exactly what they shouldn't, and that's chase yield. And, uh, you know, that's what you should not do at a market top. You should be trying to preserve principle and go with the best quality asset type, which oftentimes, or more often than not, doesn't provide the highest yield. And, uh, you know, having lived through 2008, 
which uh, most brokers currently selling DSTs did not. Uh, we saw what property types worked best and what property types did not. And uh, pretty much straight up uh, operating assets, whether it was self-storage, uh, multifamily, what have you, held up best uh, during, the, uh, during the market collapse in 2008. And it's, I think, in no small part due to the fact that they have many, many tenants. And so it takes uh, something very, very major to create a big enough st- disruption and big enough move out where that simply wasn't the case with single tenant net lease assets where companies did go bankrupt and you had a big black hole and it became problematic as to your ability to relet that property. So operating assets certainly did best last time around in 2008 and given the unprecedented overvaluation of stocks, bonds and real estate today, in our humble opinion, uh, we hope, we think that operating assets may provide a safe haven for people or a safer haven for people when uh, the air finally comes out of this bubble as well. So, but the but as far as sponsors and people, you're you're choosing typically sponsors that have been in the game. Yeah, we. I mean, it's it. Most of the. Most of the sponsors currently in the DST space, for better or for worse, are post-2008 creations. Uh, Inland, Pasco, uh, AEI, and maybe a couple others predate 2008, but most other DST providers came into the space, that are in the space now, came into the space subsequent to 2008. That doesn't mean they're not good property providers, good property managers. All it means is that they, they haven't been through a serious damage down market and down markets are inevitable so we like to we like to choose those property providers that either have a uh, a distinguished retail track record or distinguished institutional track record, meaning there are syndicators in the DST space now, in the retail space, that had very successful track records buying, managing, and selling properties for institutional investors prior to 2000 to 2008 and extended uh, their, you know, their market footprint subsequent to that. So we like to focus our investors on those property providers that have some sort of credible institutional or retail track record through a down market. It's certainly no guarantee, but it sh- but we do believe it is, is some evidence of managerial competency when the chips are down and the chips haven't been down for quite a long time and you don't really know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. So, you know, and that's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah. So, so as far as the, the players, if somebody wants to buy something in the DST space, you've got to understand you've got the sponsor that's basically putting the investment together. You've got the, the broker. Mm-hmm. You've got a broker-dealer that you work with that's, that's sort of culling the, the field of offerings, right? I yes. mean, and, 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 but as far as any individual broker, it's, it's, it's just like a real estate broker where you're, you're going to offer what you believe to be the best offerings for your clientele. But it's it's not something where you're stuck with a certain pool of properties or sponsors per se. I mean, if you've got something out there, this broker dealer you're with is one you've been with for a while, and and you like the product that they're offering on this stuff. But as far as diversification, anything else, you're able to take care of it. I think yeah, certainly we're able to take care of it because most broker dealers, most broker dealers who are serious about participating in the DST space they're all independent broker dealers are going to have selling agreements with most of the major credible DST property providers. So it's really a question then of uh, the, you know, the broker guiding you through those offerings and being able to bring you up to speed, educate you, the pros and cons of operating assets versus single tenant net lease assets, uh, uh, the company itself, its track record. And I think also importantly, because DSTs are totally they're, they're turnkey product, meaning it's a totally passive investment. Someone else is going to be running the real estate show for you. So in that sense, management 
management's track record, management's ability, management's integrity is every bit as important as the property itself. So I think you as an investor not only need to come up to speed on what we call the objective part of DST in terms of what is it, where is it, uh, who's tending it, you know, what's the leverage, what's the cash flow, but also who are the people bringing us this offering and who are the people that are going to be managing this offering. So you also have to be come up to speed or be familiar with what we'll call the subjective aspect of DST in terms of who is who's behind the scenes driving this process from a product standpoint and a managerial standpoint because you know, in a big bull market, which is all we've been in since 2008, because all interest rates have done is go down, everybody looks like a hero, okay? When the tide finally goes out, which will happen because interest rates will go up in the not too distant future because inflation is here, then you're going to find out who's really good from a managerial standpoint. And so that component Who's driving, who's driving the process, who's bringing the product, how credible are they, how much integrity do they have, do they have an uninterrupted track record of putting manager, or excuse me, investor capitalism in front of managerial capitalism, that's critical. Yeah. You have to know that. Great. One of the things I love about doing these with Bob is, is that I get to sit here and listen and learn from you. I'm usually the one, jop, 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 so I get to, I get to sit back and... Let it go. So I don't, know, I don't know if that's possible. Yes, yeah, yes, so. yes. So we're we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back talk about inflation and its impact on uh, all things real estate and all things period. So once again, David Moore, Equity Advantage with Robert Smith, Peregrine Private Capital. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be right back. <music> Thank you.